Good afternoon. Welcome to the sixth and final installment of our series on the future of US-China relations. It's been an eventful six weeks, uh, and it seems quite appropriate that we are closing this session, this series of, of uh, webinars, uh, the Friday before the election, an election that will have a great deal uh, to say about the future of US-China relations. So I'll do the PSA to start with, which is if you have not voted yet, uh, please get out there and do so uh, soon. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, by Tuesday, however, the, the rules work in, in your jurisdiction. Anyway, I'm Jacques Delisle. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Contemporary China here at the University of Pennsylvania. And again, I want to thank you for joining us for the sixth and final session of the Penn Project on the Future of US-China Relations webinar. Uh, this is the end of our six weeks of webinar, but it is definitely not uh, the end of our project. Uh, we urge you to keep reading the policy papers as they go up and to keep on our list uh, or go to our website to find out about uh, future events. Uh, this round is about technology issues and it will be hosted by my co-organizer in this project, Nason Mahbubi. I'd like to thank Nason and to thank Avery Goldstein, my predecessor as director of the center uh, for all they have done uh, in collaborating uh, with me, the three of us in getting this project going. Uh, first, a, a word or two about the project itself. Uh, as our regular uh, viewers and participants know, the motivation behind this project is that we believe we are at a turning point in US-China relations. It's a relationship that was pretty positive for a long time, has turned pretty negative recently, and that has a lot on the plate, a lot of issues to deal with, and that we're at a moment where many decisions are going to need to be made uh, that will affect the trajectory of US policy toward China and US-China relations. To that end, we have brought together a, a wonderful group of experts, mostly younger generation people, who bring to the table the kind of depth of expertise in various aspects of what is now a rich and multifaceted relationship, uh, and therefore have the ability as well as the interest to bring that kind of knowledge and expertise to bear at the granular level of a lot of the issues we have to deal with. We think that's a way of getting past, um, not terribly enlightening, uh, providing more heat than light sorts of debates about the general trajectory of the relationship, whether it's adversarial, whether engagement can be revived or something like that. So if you've been with us for the last five weeks, you've seen some terrific discussions of various aspects ranging from security to economics to uh, educational and academic uh, freedom type issues, human rights, law, democracy, um, and much else. I urge you to look at those videos if you were not able to join us and to look at the papers that have been produced that are on the website and this group's uh, papers are up as well. Um, and I don't want to eat up much more time here other than to say that we're delighted to have our, our sixth and last but far from least panel uh, here today to deal with uh, technology and related issues. Uh, and to once again thank all the participants, all 20 of our paper writers and our, our senior advisors and mentors. Uh, and to thank uh, the people who have been behind the scenes making this possible, uh, Yun Yan Zeng, the Associate Director of our Center, and Amanda Morrison, our Fellow for this project. I'd also like to again thank the China Research and Engagement Fund here at Penn for providing uh, many of the resources we're relying on here, and the Henry Luce Foundation for its generous contribution as well. And I'll just say a few words about logistics before I turn it over to Nason to moderate today's panel. We are doing this as a webinar, which means that if you wish to raise a question or a comment, please use the Q&A function. Those are not visible to other participants, uh, but our moderator and panelists will be able to see them and the moderator will uh, put some of, the, uh, some of the questions, as many as we can get to, uh, to the panelists to discuss. You should also keep an eye on the chat function. You will not be able to put uh, questions or comments into the chat, but that uh, chat feed will give you information about the project about uh, reminders about how we're working this webinar and ways of accessing some of the outputs. So without further ado, uh, let me uh, once again uh, thank everyone for joining us today and joining us over the past six weeks. Urge you to uh, look for what's coming up ahead. Uh, get out and vote and here's Nathan. Thank you, Jacques. And welcome everyone to today's discussion where we'll be talking about issues relating to technology within the broader context of US-China relations. I think it's probably fair to say that the area of technology has been the sharpest flashpoint for the downturn in US-China relations in recent years. And ongoing competition and conflict between the two countries on issues like 5G, data privacy, artificial intelligence, not to mention sheer market power for tech companies are an absolute certainty in the years to come. In broad terms, issues of concern on the US side in this area fall into three main buckets. First, 
concerns over the growth of China's surveillance state at home and export of those underlying technologies abroad. Second, concerns over the national security implications of successful Chinese tech companies like Huawei, WeChat, and of course, TikTok. And third, concerns over the growth of Chinese influence over international standard setting in this area. Fortunately for our project, and now for you, our audience today, the three papers we have commissioned on the theme of technology address each of these sets of issues in turn. Our authors, Sheena Greidens, Robert Williams, and Julia Vu, are each leading voices who have been deeply engaged in research and writing on each of the particular sets of issues you'll hear them address today. In the interest of time, I won't introduce them in full to you now. You can read their bios as well as the policy papers upon which their comments today are based on our project website, which you'll also see noted in our chat window. For now, let me just briefly welcome all three. Sheena Greidens, who is an associate professor at the LBJ School of Government at the University of Texas at Austin, where her work focuses on authoritarian politics in East Asia, as well as American national security and foreign policy. Robert Williams, who is a senior research scholar in law and the executive director of the Paul Tsai China Center at Yale Law School, where he focuses on US-China relations and Chinese law and policy. And Julia Vu, the cyber fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs, where she leads the team behind Belfer's National Cyber Power Index and was formerly the research director for the China Cyber Policy Initiative. Welcome to you all. So given the complexity of this area and the uh, slight uh, differences between the different papers and the takes that they take, I think it might be useful to talk to each of the authors individually for a bit before we start asking them some cross-cutting questions and then opening up to questions from you and the audience. So let's go in order and we'll start with Sheena who wrote her paper on China's surveillance state at home and abroad, challenges for US policy. Sheena, why don't you start things off by giving us a brief overview of the main points in your paper? Yeah, sure. Thanks so much for the invitation to join the webinar and to be part of this project. Um, you know, Nathan, as your remarks mentioned, uh, tech issues have really emerged at the heart of US-China tensions in the last several years. And so it's great to be part of a, a wide ranging discussion on these issues that have become so central to American foreign policy and American national security, um, as well as to the US-China relationship specifically. My paper focuses on one dimension of the tech, uh, the tech issues and the, the tech um, tensions, which has to do with China's uh, development and export of surveillance technology. And broadly speaking, the paper finds that under Xi Jinping in particular, China has pursued a surveillance state of immense scale and ambition. There's a, a terrific set of data and a report out from China file today that, that details procurement documents that, that total in the billions of dollars um, in terms of the amount that, that China has invested in these efforts. And this surveillance state is really focused on a term um, prevention and control which has to do with trying to prevent risks to social stability. It's even more um, sort of aggressive or assertive than the previous doctrine of stability maintenance. Um, and it really focuses on using technology and surveillance technology to prevent and control risks to social stability and in particular to CCP rule. Um, so technology is really the key tool by which the regime's preventive aims are to be achieved. The, the paper also notes that the rise of the surveillance state has had really significant global consequences. So it documents that over the course of the past decade, Chinese surveillance and policing technologies, many of the same hardware and data integration platforms that are being used in the domestic projects at home have been adopted in more than 80 countries worldwide, both democratic and autocratic on every continent at this point, except Australia and Antarctica. And so this really is a global issue. Um, so when we think about it, it's not just an issue for the US-China relationship, it's also an issue of how the US-China relationship fits into contemporary global politics and American policy worldwide. So the final point that I wanna make about the findings of the paper are, is this issue that 
you know, the, the spread, the global spread of this technology is really driven both by the supply that comes out of China, right? The fact that the surveillance state exists to create a global supply, um, but also for global demand for these technologies. The fact that there are governments around the world that have found that these technologies can solve governance problems, um, can you know be used to address their own challenges. Um, and so it's both the, the supply from China and a global demand for these technologies that is driving their diffusion and their worldwide adoption. Um, and the reason that I, I wanna close on that as a key finding of the paper is that uh, you know thinking about both sides of that equation i believe and i argue in the paper is really necessary as a first step not just for understanding the diffusion of chinese surveillance technology um, but actually crafting effective policy to address it um, in the future u.s china relationship so i'll stop there and uh, and i'm happy to follow up so so sheena let me ask you a, a follow-up on your findings before we start talking about your recommendations and you know, you, you talk about how there is a global dimension to this, of course, with the Chinese surveillance technologies uh, being exported to more than 80 countries worldwide. But I know in your work generally, you've been tracking the rise of the surveillance state uh, generally, even including in our own country in the US. And so I wonder if you could say a little bit more about what is distinctive about the Chinese rise of the surveillance state that sets it apart from similar dynamics that are happening uh, including in our own country and uh, similar technologies that are being developed even by American companies and also being exported to many of the same countries that we're talking about here? Yeah, that's a great question. And there is no question that this is a, a global marketplace, that there are American companies involved in this, that you know we're seeing CCTV cameras um, proliferate worldwide. I think there are a few key differences. Um, first of all, one of the things that we know is that in... Um, many Western countries, at least, and I can't, I don't have global data at my fingertips. So I, I, um, I wish I could be a little bit more precise about this characterization than I'm going to be during the webinar. Um, but there are a lot of places where many of the cameras are privately owned and privately operated. And so law enforcement can go and access them after the fact. So I was once um, held up, I was once carjacked and the police went and accessed a restaurant security camera after the fact, right? But that's not really what we're seeing um, in the Chinese case. The vast majority of the cameras and the security surveillance infrastructure is owned and operated by the party state. Um, there are private cameras, but the information actually flows to platforms, data integration platforms in particular, that are operated um, often at the local level um, by local authorities. And the key thing that I think we're in some sense missing um, about the China surveillance story is that we tend to focus on information collection. Um, and, and that's easy to do, right? Because you see facial recognition cameras and CCTV cameras, and that's the stuff that we can picture and you know, pick up, or that's the physical manifestation of this. But in some sense, what's actually more powerful and, and I think also distinctive about China's approach is the back end process of data integration. And um, the fact that that data integration is being done by government authorities. So it, it creates a, again, and let me caveat also that that, that effort to integrate data in China is, uh, is incomplete but it is clearly a stated aim of the Chinese party state. They have a concept called information islands that they refer to. They're, they are openly concerned that the development of all this technology is leading to the collection of data that then can't actually be put together and used. And so I think you know one of the stories that we haven't paid enough attention to is not just the project of data collection, but the process of data integration and data analysis that happens on the back end, but which is much less visible to all of us um, wherever we're sitting uh, here today. That's really interesting. I would love to keep talking to you about that, but uh, in the interest of time, let's move on a little bit and get to the recommendations that you've developed uh, for this project. Uh, can you briefly summarize what your key recommendations are? Absolutely. The project makes eight key recommendations. And I wanna say at the outset, um, there's a lot that's already being done on uh, China's development and export of surveillance technology. Um, so the, the recommendations that I'm about to, to, to walk through are really aimed at addressing gaps that exist, right? So this is not to say that I think some of the things already being done are bad ideas or are unnecessary or should be walked back, 
just that these are additional steps that I think the United States uh, in particular um, should, should consider when it's trying to address this challenge. Right. So the first thing is that I think the United States fundamentally needs a coordinated interagency strategy that addresses the development and spread of Chinese surveillance technology. We need that because it'll provide an overarching vision, a shared lexicon, and a reference point and a set of standards that then different agencies or the interagency process can use to assess policy trade-offs. Um, there's a very brief mention in the administration's, uh, the White House's China strategy on the export of Chinese surveillance technology. But what we've seen is a set of kind of one-off steps um, in a very decentralized process. And it's not clear sort of what kind of a framework that, that adds up to. And so I think that that, that's, that interagency strategy, probably run by the National Security Council, is a really important next step for the challenge that we're facing. The second thing that I think the United States needs to develop as a matter of process is a way to regularly track and assess the spread and the effects of Chinese surveillance technology. We don't actually know enough about the effects of these, these technologies in different political contexts around the world. And so, for example, the State Department does annual reporting where this could become a, a sort of systematic feature, but we need a process that more regularly tracks um, what's going on with this technology globally. So then the strategy should do a couple of other things. It really needs to understand the audience that it's trying to communicate with, and in many cases to differentiate messaging by region or country. Huawei's marketing is quite region specific, but the United States rhetoric so far has been kind of a one size fits all, we're concerned about China, rather than tailoring to the officials who are often turning to that technology out of desire, sometimes even desperation to solve legitimate governance challenges like global crime. So the second piece of that is that the strategy needs to understand the incentives and the knowledge that the people actually making these adoption decisions bring to bear. Usually those are governors or mayors. And so the subnational um, communication element of a, of a strategy is going to be really important. Third piece of that is that we need to then, when we go and talk to, to, to people, subnational officials, officials in, in these different regions and countries, um, is to be able to articulate and address the challenges that Chinese surveillance technology is often being brought in to address, like crime, um, like underlying government challenge, gover governance challenges. Um, and then the last thing that that strategy really needs to include is an explicit plan for standard setting in formal and informal multilateral settings. Um, I could talk a lot more about that, but I know that Julia has a lot to say about that, so I'm gonna I'm gonna hold off on on that. Um, then, you know, another piece of this is that U.S. strategy should have a second layer of policy. So right now, the United States is principally focused on pushing for de-adoption. But there are going to be cases, and in my data, I find that de-adoption is actually pretty rare. It's much more likely that other countries are going to say, okay, we'll use this platform, but boy, we're going to put really tight technical or legal safeguards around it to make sure it doesn't compromise democracy and to make sure data is secure. And so if the United States has a case where de-adoption is not feasible, I think we should have a fallback plan where we go and we still work with countries to create the right technical and legal safeguards around the use of, of this technology um, until such time as maybe the, the adoption decision can be revisited, or maybe it won't, and it's less of a concern or a threat because these safeguards are in place. The final two recommendations have to do with American policy at home. Um, the first one, a first domestically focused recommendation is that the United States needs to think really hard about how to develop and maintain its own edge in innovation and technology. That's almost, almost cliched at this point that that itself could be an entire series of papers, how the United States should do that. But that needs to be, you know, there are a different set of interagency actors who need to be incorporated into that coordinated strategy so that the domestic innovative edge that the United States has is maintained. And then the final point, um, which I think is really important because it's been in the news so much lately, is that the United States as a matter of strategy needs to think very, very carefully about the role of the Chinese diaspora. And that the strategy that we have, all of the, the interagency process that shapes US policy needs to account for the, the imperative that the United States recruit and retain the best global tech talent um, and pursue effective counterintelligence but it needs to do that in a way that doesn't alienate an important and valuable part of the United States, the fabric of United States society by engaging in an indiscriminate or unfair targeting. Um, 
which will also then actually hamper some of these important counterintelligence and counterespionage efforts. Um, so I think that, you know, we haven't, we all recognize that that's a thorny problem and there just needs to be more careful strategic thinking about that element of, um, of the problem here at home. Um, so those are the, the uh, eight or so recommendations that the, the, the report makes. Um, and I know there's some overlap with some of the other authors. So I really look forward to getting to the, the cross-cutting questions where we can debate, you know, what the right steps are for some of these challenges. And Sheena, there's a lot of the cross-cutting issues that we're going to get to, but there's one in particular I want to ask you about before we move on to Rob, and that has to do with your point about innovation, because I think that's something that's going to definitely come up a few times, but I'm curious how you see it in this context of these technologies that have to do with surveillance. It seemed to me that a point that was recurring throughout your paper and your presentation is that in some ways the concern that we have on the U.S. side is less about the technology itself, but more about the governance around it. Um, but I wonder if there is something about the technology itself that is problematic that, you know, we don't want innovation in or, or conversely, do we want innovation in some of the underlying technologies so long as the governance around it is improved? Well, for, you know, that's, again, that's a really complicated question and I'm not sure I can do it justice in the, the time that we have here, but I'll note that there are areas where there are both technical and policy solutions and further innovation may actually be helpful in resolving some of the, the, the fundamental technical challenges that we have. So for example, we know that there are um, things to do with facial recognition and the way that algorithms work that can actually amplify racial or ethnic biases. Um, and there's probably a technical solution where innovation might be able to come up with a, you know, a, a way of using technology that's appropriate for democratic policing, um, not intrusive on people's civil liberties and democracy, um, and also not discriminatory or biased. Um, so again, with, with many of these challenges, it's there's probably both a, a technical or an innovation solution, um, but also a, a policy and a regulatory solution. And so I see them very much as, as operating in tandem. Um, I'm sort of uncomfortable with the idea that we should shut down all research, but universities have ethics boards and ethical guidelines um, for a reason. And those need to be regularly updated and strengthened to make sure that the, the research that's being done is in fact ethical and being put to ethical applications as well. Um, but that's also where export controls um, and supply chain issues come in. And again, like I said, there's already been a lot of attention to a number of those issues in the US policy debate so far. Um, I think that discussion needs to continue. Um, but I, you know, I think as far as, as I look at it, I, you know, that's, those are the two ways, two primary baskets of, of policy tools that we have to address that concern. That's great. And, and I hope we can come back to some of these uh, issues in the Q and A, but now we're going to move on to Rob Williams. I should say one of my uh, favorite things just to set things off with Rob is that, uh, we asked him to write about, uh, Huawei and TikTok. And the paper he gave us is titled Beyond Huawei and TikTok, Untangling US Concerns Over Chinese Tech Companies and Digital Security. So Rob, uh, why don't you uh, kick us off with a summary of the main points of your paper? Sure, thanks, Nathan. I'm really grateful to be a part of this project and uh, you know to get to learn from people like Sheena and, and Julia. I uh, appreciate your leading this. Also wanna thank your colleagues, Jacques and, and Avery. Uh, and Yuan Yuan, uh, Amanda, your whole team, you know, for what y'all have done with, uh, with this initiative. My paper is essentially trying to unpack the challenges facing U.S. policymakers when it comes to thinking about Chinese technology companies and their operations in the U.S. market in particular. Um, there are a lot, a lot of different issues at play. Uh, Sheena just covered uh, several of them. And they tend to merge traditional conceptions of national security, economic interests, and values-based concerns. Um, these issues are, are sometimes conflated or are weakly specified. So my hope is to kind of clarify why I think it is that we're seeing particular concern about Chinese companies like Huawei and TikTok. And the descriptive account that I give is basically about how technology policy vis-a-vis -vis China is increasingly viewed through a national security lens for two reasons. Uh, number one, the nature of the technologies themselves 
uh, and the inherent risks associated with them. So I focus for purposes of illustration on, on 5G communications uh, and artificial intelligence. And second, uh, reasons that have to do with policies and characteristics of China's government. Uh, so I can say more about what I mean by that, but, but I try to show how these concerns have played out uh, in the context of, of Huawei, which makes 5G equipment, uh, and the video sharing app TikTok, which is owned by ByteDance, uh, one of China's you know, most dynamic companies in the AI space. In short, the descriptive goal is, number one, to explain how we got here uh, with the ongoing barrage of, of US measures against these companies. Um, number two, to kind of give some empirical context uh, and grounding as to, to why we find ourselves in this state of securitization of tech policy. And third, to try to disaggregate those concerns and tease out some of the trade-offs in thinking about policy measures that may be intended to reduce risk exposure, but may in fact kind of shoot ourselves in the foot from the standpoint of both U.S. technological competitiveness and national security, which themselves are, are closely intertwined. So that's the descriptive project. And then the normative question is, what do we do about that? Right? How, how should policy be adjusted to account for the complexities here? Uh, so I have uh, like five suggestions for how the U.S. could shift to, to a more affirmative agenda uh, that, that kind of widens the aperture beyond Chinese companies and beyond a mostly unilateral approach. And given the complex trade-offs involved, I think one important part of that is something Sheena mentioned, you know, a, a new kind of institutional mechanism uh, to help us navigate this space a bit more coherently. Uh, so I'm happy to go into more detail on that, but I'll stop there for now. Yeah, Rob, I definitely want to get to your recommendations and, and have you elaborate on that. But let me ask a, a question before that, that's in some ways analogous to the uh, initial question I asked uh, Sheena, which is when you think about these Chinese companies like Huawei and, and TikTok and WeChat, uh, we could also talk about, and then you think about uh, American companies that are in roughly the same space, whether it be Apple or Google or uh, Facebook. Um, in some ways, it seems as if some of the privacy concerns are not so different. Maybe the national security concerns are different, but there's some underlying issues that seem to be common to all of these different types of new tech companies that transcend borders. And so I wonder if you could say something about that, about how you differentiate um, the particular national security risks posed by these Chinese companies from the risks that are common to all of these tech companies in this new world we live in. Yeah, it's a great question. So why don't I answer that first by saying a little bit about the, uh, the technological risks that you referred to. Um, so technologies such as 5G and AI create enormous new opportunities, but also new vulnerabilities. Uh, you know, I refer to them as omni-use, uh, by which I mean three things. Uh, first, they have kind of inherently dual use or, or civilian and military applications, but also uh, second, they, they underpin and serve as building blocks for many follow-on applications and end-use technologies to be built on top of them. And then third, they're pervasive and growing in importance to the functioning of national economies and defense institutions. So all this in, in combination blurs the lines between economic and national security interests, particularly given the 5G and AI, which, which are the, the areas that I use for illustration, they both introduce novel security risks. So let me just say something about that before I uh, turn to the, the differentiation point. For 5G, you know, I, I think of it as critical infrastructure, um, not only because networks will be utilized by the commercial and governmental sectors, uh, but also because you know, with the rise of internet of things, entire economies will be dependent on the smooth functioning of these networks. And the potential vulnerabilities are, are considerable. I mean, in traditional networks, kind of everything came to, to hardware choke points where you can practice cyber hygiene, uh, and in the 5G you know, so-called software defined network, that activity is more pushed outward uh, to a web of, of digital routers throughout the network. And that kind of limits the potential for choke point inspection and control. You know, also I, I said, I used the term software defined. You know, that means AI 
can and, and will be used both to defend, uh, but also to attack these networks. And so, you know, that kind of brings me to AI, which is not even a singular technology, but rather a tool that has countless uses. Um, so, you know, the computer vision and machine learning algorithms that support social networking and image and speech recognition, predictive analytics, uh, pattern of life analysis, and on and on, you know, these can, can offer enormous potential benefits for the missions of, of militaries and security services. So one of the common threads here between these technologies is data. You know, it's a key ingredient in the development of AI. It's also the lifeblood of a communication system. So what you have is a scenario where data privacy is uh, becoming synonymous with national security. And you layer on top of that, the fact that you have major Chinese companies in these sectors, Huawei and 5G, ByteDance uh, in AI, and they're expanding into overseas markets. And the question is, uh, you know, the, the question of whether that is a special problem, uh, given the risks associated with the technologies, is not merely a question of what those companies' business practices are, but also, you know, I think is necessarily informed by background assumptions or assessments uh, about China's political legal system. In the paper, I, I look at four aspects of China's system, uh, sort of expressed strategic ambitions, uh, policies and practices that may be troubling, like uh, IP theft or, or hacking of US companies, uh, subsidies for overseas acquisitions or, or manipulation of, of technical standard setting processes, which Julia is going to talk about. Um, third, I look at, you know, the relative lack of, of rule of law constraints to check the, the party state's exercise of power over Chinese companies. And then fourth, uh, you know, specific threats to human rights and, and liberal values. And there are kind of three different versions of that set of concerns. The most direct version considers human rights violations uh, within China and, and the extent to which Chinese tech companies may be enabling or, or contributing to those abuses. The second uh, is an issue that Sheena discussed, you know, debate over the degree to which China is exporting its domestic model uh, of digital control along with the exports of, of surveillance equipment. And third, um, the potential effects of China's domestic surveillance and censorship policies for US domestic politics uh, and the integrity of American democracy, which by the way is not necessarily to be confused with influence operations or, or disinformation campaigns. Um, but anyway, there are a lot of issues at play. The problem is these issues are, as you suggest, by no means limited to China, much less to the specific question of China being the location of a company's headquarters. And despite the widespread nature of these challenges, US policy to date has been largely reactive uh, and focused on, on Chinese companies like Huawei and TikTok. So I argue in the paper that we need an approach that's a bit more uh, affirmative, more broadly applicable, uh, politically and legally sustainable, uh, and also multilateral. Well, so let's get into those details now. Why don't you uh, elaborate more on the recommendations you've developed through this project? Sure, so I have several recommendations uh, that I guess can be grouped into three categories. First, um, I argue we need a, a comprehensive data privacy and cybersecurity framework. Uh, my colleague Sam Sachs and others have written persuasively about the need for national legislation that sets high standards uh, for data collection and processing. I'd say that should be one element uh, and it should be enforceable through federal regulatory powers and private rights of action. A second component would be to rationalize our uh, cybersecurity liability regime to better incentivize uh, cyber hygiene. And third, in tandem with those two steps, I think the US should work with uh, allies and partners on a multilateral digital trade initiative that, um, that balances data security and interoperability. Uh, based on recent history, I, th I think that's probably a tall order, but I think it's particularly important given the challenges we're seeing, including with European counterparts, uh, you know, and the difficulties in finding a modus vivendi on GDPR, for example. Um, so that's the first basket. The, the second basket of proposals involves uh, pursuing creative means to disrupt and deter malicious cyber operations. Uh, among other things, I'd, I'd say we should tap the brakes on this strategy of the Department of Justice announcing 
high profile indictments of Chinese hackers, at least in cases where there's no realistic chance of, of extraditing or prosecuting the defendants, because I think that communicates a, a message of weakness, uh, frankly. Instead, you know, I think we should tr consider trying to form multilateral coalitions uh, to enforce norms against commercial cyber theft uh, and other destabilizing activities to include uh, targeted sanctions in some cases. It's the second uh, bucket. And then the third bucket of reforms, um, uh, to echo Sheena a bit, uh, are institutional. You know, how do we improve our policymaking apparatus? And what I suggest is that the U.S. should consider establishing uh, an interagency coordinating entity with oversight power uh, to examine the practical implications of prospective technology policies such as export controls, entity listings, uh, you know, supply chain risk standards, even immigration policies, subsidies, and so on. You know, a goal of this institution would be to ensure that that, that federal policies are coordinated multilaterally uh, to the extent possible and are sufficiently tailored uh, to protect sensitive technologies without undermining the innovation ecosystem by cutting off the lifeblood uh, of their development, data, investment, uh, human capital, and so forth. So I don't think there's a silver bullet solution here, but if we have more voices from more perspectives weighing in on these issues, I think we're likely to wind up with uh, better policy at the end of the day. Rob, before we move on to Julia, let's talk a little bit also about the issue that I talked with Sheena at the end of our dialogue earlier, uh, innovation. Um, because you do reference that at the end, that you want to uh, you know, tailor your recommendations in such a way as that they not only don't curtail innovation, but even promote them. And, and so I wonder, like, how, how do you think of this problem of innovation in this particular area, you know, the, some of these Chinese companies have actually been quite innovative and innovative in ways that have been uh, drawn from, you know, what once we might have thought were productive working relationships with, uh, you know, U.S. technology uh, companies and actors. And so how, how much of that is something that you worry about and how much of that is something that you think can be preserved even with a more careful approach in the future? Yeah, well, uh, can, can I just adopt Sheena's answer wholesale? Because I thought she really covered that nicely in terms of identifying both a set of technical solutions uh, that uh, could be developed to, to help us, um, you know, retain interoperability, retain uh, the, uh, you know, as I put it before, the, the kind of lifeblood of innovation, uh, which requires these cross-border data flows. Um, without, uh, you know, sacrificing, um, uh, you know, principles. And, and you know, I think governance uh, is certainly another part of the solution and, and governance can take different forms. You know, it's somewhat encouraging to see uh, industry groups uh, starting to look uh, very hard at, you know, what it means to develop, uh, you know, ethical uh, AI or, or, or to develop uh, AI in, in an ethical manner, to be thinking about some of the issues that Sheena referred to, uh, algorithmic bias and the like. Um, it is, I think, encouraging to see academic and industry groups increasingly focus on that. You know, it would be nice, frankly, to uh, have more Chinese academic uh, and industry voices in those conversations. It's politically difficult um, to, to do things like that. But that's something that uh, would be nice to see going forward, if for no other reason uh, than you know to to just uh, understand better uh, where we're all coming from and where we really differ, uh, and where maybe the differences are uh, you know more sort of at the surface or, or or you know actors with whom we might engage in different constituencies, who. You know, have leverage within their respective uh, systems, whether that be an industry or, or an academe or, or otherwise. So, uh, you know, that's just to, to add a bit of flavor to, to what Sheena said, but I quite agree that, you know, a kind of combination of both technical and governance solutions uh, makes a lot of sense. Well, Rob, your last point, uh, which is fascinating, actually really nicely anticipates uh, Julia's paper. Uh, you know, this notion of wanting to have Chinese actors be more involved in the crafting of how we think about this stuff. In many ways, one might have thought that having Chinese actors be more involved in the shaping of international standards 
would be a good thing, but that's actually become a, a flashpoint for concern uh, about, uh, about the Chinese uh, activities in this area. And so Julia has written about this topic, uh, her paper, Shaping Global Technology Governance, Why the U.S. Must Adapt a Proactive Approach to Technical Standards for Long-Term Security. So Julia, you're up. Uh, why don't you first uh, briefly uh, summarize the main points of your paper? Sure, thank you. Sorry for giving you a mouthful of a title. I think it's the longest one that we have. Um, but, oh, and I quickly, I, I'm delighted to be part of this group. I've like really admired like Sheena and um, Rob's work from before. So I just like, it's kind of a big um, uh, kind of ego boost to be part of this group with these guys. Um, and thank you um, also to the team at UPenn um, for putting this together. So, um, Firstly, uh, global technology governance is uh, extremely fragmented and uh, the technical standards um, process with it is just one part of this. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of background first um, uh, to like technical standards and how it fits into this picture of US-China relations. Um, so most of, for most of history, the internet and related technologies have been governed in a really ad hoc way, as I mentioned. And there's a hodgepodge of entities with very different governance models, philosophies, and also levels of influence. And so for technical standards, um, these are agreed uh, at domestic level. The focus of my paper is the international um, standards development organizations. Um, and the, the standards that are agreed in these organizations basically become the rules um, for uh, technology um, that is um, that want to be interoperable in an international system. Um, there are also many different types of standards and um, levels of enforceability, um, and we don't really have space um, to go into that in detail here, but so this is just like, a, I guess, an over overview of this, how this works. Um, Another thing I'd like to point out is that the US's technological primacy um, for the past couple of decades has basically granted it de facto influence in these standards development organizations. You know, the US hasn't needed to be proactive. Um, but as the capability gap between the US and China has closed, and this influence can no longer be taken for granted. Um, and so, like, from, from my view, and as mentioned um, by Sheena and Rob, like, this is a key part of the US-China technology competition. Um, and um, most people in the audience may have heard of them in this context when people talk about you know, 5G, that's a suite of standards. Or when um, I think there were a few FT articles about China pushing a new protocol in the International Telecommunications Union called New IP, which would create a more centralized kind of governance network for the internet. Um, but, you know, technical standards are really part of our everyday lives. Like you might not realize, but, you know, the reason why you are so many people are able to dial into this call from their laptops, iPads, mobile phones is because of technical standards enabling that interoperability. Right. So. Um, uh, second. Um, and it's also like a hugely lucrative thing. Um, so there's a reason for the US to get on the front foot here, um, because um, some standards include patents, right? So for one example, I think in 2017, um, Nokia generated like 1.86 billion, which was um, as a result of the standards that other companies had adopted um, for the technology it designed, and that was 7% of its revenue. And, you know, the, U the US has enjoyed these kinds of um, revenues uh, for the past, uh, you know, few decades through like 3G and 4G as well. Um, so, you know, in this paper, I really made the case that the US should revisit its hands off approach to developing technical standards um, to address its declining tech influence. Um, but also, um, I want to point out that uh, there are a number of global challenges that all uh, governments are facing right now, um, and that's a result of the technology is kind of introducing um, uh, challenges that we haven't been able to face before that require, as Sheena and Rob both said, like a technology and a policy solution. Um, and um, there is no uh, no good system that has been created yet, um, but also the existing system that governs parts of technology is a total mess, like I mentioned at the beginning. Um, and so, uh, in, like in this paper, I look a little bit at how um, much influence um, China has in the standard setting arena, and also, um, you know, a, a little bit at what the other national actors are doing as well. 
So, so Julia, before we get deeper into your recommendations, let me ask a couple of questions. Um, you know, something that strikes me is that when we think about what Sheena wrote about and what Rob wrote about, there are some, you know, you could say, frankly, pernicious aspects to Chinese, uh, you know, technological developments in those areas. Here, where it's just Chinese technical experts becoming more sophisticated and savvy and active in international standard setting bodies, it seems to me at least that that, that pernicious aspect is, is somewhat less. And the bigger issue here is simply that the US in particular has not been as active in those bodies um, to basically you know, play a more robust role in those bodies. And so I wanna see if that's the right takeaway. Um, and if so, why do you think that, you know, what's the, um, what are the politics of the US actually becoming more involved in uh, these technical standard bodies? What's the, you know, is it that we don't believe in those bodies and so we're not gonna get involved in them or is there some other type of reason why the US is not more engaged? Yeah, um, good question. Um, so, I think um, the US and allies actually in many technical standards bodies um, at the government level, so um, kind of uh, adopt a position of uh, maintaining uh, the status quo. Um, and that is based on the assumption um, that um, their, their companies will you know, win out at the end of the day because they have the market power. Um, but and, and so they haven't needed to adopt that strategy. Um, and there's also a view that um, in, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of standards development organizations have different models of governance. And, um, you know, um, there is a uh, view that um, standards should be set by the experts, should be driven by industry. Um, you know, increasingly that is um, uh, not going to be the the as good a solution when it starts touching on like societal and policy issues. So we actually need to have a rethink of how these standards are set to make sure that the right people at the table. Um, and the US tends to favor a model of governance, which is multi-stakeholder, multi which kind of includes business, includes a bit of civil society. But um, in my paper, I basically uh, highlight that, you know, multi-stakeholder governance in the organizations that the US uh, tends to support, um, it's not really multi-stakeholder. You know, even though some of these um, organizations like the IETF are like very, like are free and open, anyone can sign up to mailing lists, there is, you know, a technical barrier to, um, you know, participating. So that will cut out a lot of perhaps like smaller companies that don't have the resource to send in developing countries that don't have the expertise to be at these, at these, um, uh, are these round tables um, and um, you know then and, and there are other organizations that are like pay to play um, and so you know it, it's it's really and the industry driven and so it's really not that accessible and there needs to be something I think done here and it touches on a point that I think Sheena mentioned earlier which is having an understanding of what other governments like want in that technology um, and like why they're choosing to participate in some other forum and why as opposed to others and how can we bring more people to the table because otherwise if we don't do this the risk is that the system will become more fragmented um, so uh, i was having a little bit of a dig around um, in the like as many data points as I can find to have a look at participation in the standards organizations. And as I mentioned, like, it's pretty hard, you know, it's either behind like a very high membership fee or kind of impenetrable, impenetrable, hard to access. <laughs> so, um, you know, what we can see is, um, Oh, China has led, you know, the three key standards development organizations um, that are named in the World Trade Organization's Technical Barriers Trade Agreement um, for most of the past few decades. Um, that means that I guess it, it's um, been able to set a lot of the agendas, but it also shows that they are like highly effective technical experts that have been like voted in by other countries to, they are credible, right? Um, and then also, um, a lot of standards development organizations have um, much larger delegations of um, Chinese experts coming to participate. Um, 
And people have said that Chinese delegates flood these forum with contributions. And so I was really interested in this, um, uh, this uh, uh, generalization. I just wanted to see how much truth there was. And you know, it's a little bit limited because I can only access so many documents. Um, but for example, if we look at the International Telecommunications Union, which is the, the organization that is multilateral, so the US doesn't really like operating in this, in this place. It's where China introduced the new IP pr protocol that's caused a few ripples over the past year because it would introduce a more centralized form of internet governance. I had a look at the data for contributions over the past decade in a few study groups. And yes, uh, China has been um, submitting the most contributions over the past 10 years. But in second place is South Korea, third place is France. Like, you know, it's not an organization that has been dominated by authoritarian governments. Like, and there's a reason to participate in here. And I don't think that policymakers, um, I think we're only really scratching the surface of how these organizations operate and um, the ability to get um, the, what we really need. And I haven't got this golden data point yet is, you know, it's useful for us to know who's contributing because then we have an idea of who wants to shape the technology agenda. And then it's useful for us to know what technology standards are adopted because then we're like, okay, so that's what that's what the standard is. But what we really need to know, I think, is who is then adopting those technical standards because that's where you have impact in the market. And that data point is really hard to come by. Um, and so that's- and my Julia, I'm just in the interest of time, I'm gonna <laughs> jump in here um, because we're starting to get some questions in the Q&A and, and also your fellow panelists have some thoughts too. But I did wanna give you, and only maybe a minute or two now, to if there's anything left in terms of your recommendations that you wanna elaborate on. Um, but again, we should keep this short because we need to, we need to start getting to the Q&A. Yeah, well, okay. So, um, sorry about that. The, I think China should, um, the US should, to develop a strategy with industry to engage in all of these fora. We need to get those data points to basically figure out exactly which standards development organizations are having an impact. There's huge inefficiencies in the system. And this is not only gonna be beneficial for the US and its allies, it's gonna be beneficial for the whole kind of global technology governance in general, because it's a mess and we need to know as a global community how to govern things better. Um, and another thing that I'd like to end on is that you know technical standards making is not a winner takes all game. Like, Chinese companies, um, US companies, and other companies like buy and sell standards, uh, you know, standard essential patents, like it is part of global trade. And the 5G standard suite that China is leading in, there are also, you know, Ericsson and Nokia and other countries that are part of that as well. I think we are being a bit general about who is dominating what, but there are economic benefits to other countries. And we also have to get used to the fact that China is going to be um, like stay up there on top of like innovation and we have to find specific areas to collaborate with China. Great, okay. So we're starting to get the questions in the Q and A. Um, remind all the audience members that uh, that's the way to ask questions. Then I'll pose them to the panelists. Um, uh, there's one question which I wanna just address quickly. Someone asked, will I be able to access the recording of this lecture? And yes, indeed, we will be posting the video of this on Tuesday as we usually do along with a summary of the findings and recommendations of this group. Um, but otherwise, before I start asking uh, some of the questions that are coming in, uh, I know that uh, Sheena and Rob may have something to say about this question of standard settings as well. And so I just wanna give both of you an opportunity to say something before we open it up to the audience. Sheena, do you wanna go first? Sure, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I, I guess um, I find the standard setting dynamics that we're observing right now in the international system a, a, maybe a bit more concerning. Um, and I think there's a the, there's a couple of things going on here. Um, it's not clear that there's sort of a you know necessarily a, a pernicious or aggressive or democracy undermining democracy corrosive intent on the part of the CCP in participating. Right? It's a it's a large country with a large economy and a lot of innovation. And so yes, of course, it's going to um, to be participating in global standard setting processes. So I don't find that in and of itself necessarily concerning. But I do find that what we've observed in other cases is that the nature of the major powers in the international system, in particular whether or not they're democratic or authoritarian, has a lot of spillover consequences for um, the sort of pattern of democracy and liberties and freedoms in 
the rest of the world, right? That's a, a long standing centuries long pattern in the international system. And so what could happen here, especially when you think about the adoption of some of these technologies and platforms in the surveillance realm, um, is that you have officials adopting them in third countries who often don't think through the global implications or don't have the, the knowledge or the access to information to think through some of the challenges that Rob raised or some of the issues with data security. Um, and privacy and don't necessarily always have strong democratic or legal or political frameworks to regulate the use of that technology. And so what you can then get is um, a sort of rebound effect where something from the international system goes into a third country and you get support seated via the these these exports um, for a set of standards or a, a lack of particular standards that need to be put in to be protective of privacy and protective of democracy. Um, and so from a strict technical perspective, um, I, I, you know, there's, there's a sort of set of questions about Chinese participation. But um, what, what I see as concerning are um, standards that may be getting put in because there are there isn't broadly enough sort of globally distributed understanding of how these technologies could in the long term corrode democracy or corrode freedoms that are recognized in other international bodies right there are there are conventions on civil and political rights there are conventions um, on the rights of citizens. Um, and so to the extent that standard setting ends up producing effects that are incompatible with those other conventions and rights, um, I, I get concerned. And I think it's a it's a very, very complex process. Um, but I think that, you know, to the extent that we're thinking about um, you know, Chinese participation in standard setting, and I would hold, I would hold the United States or any country to this same sand, same standard, right? Um, intent does not equal effect. Um, and so we need to think not just about um, sort of what Chinese intent in participating is, which which may be banal or benign. Um, benign is probably a better word. Um, uh, but it may still have secondary effects that are not constructive. Um, and so we need to we that's why one of the recommendations that I made in the report is that we actually need to start measuring those effects much more precisely. Um, because I think right now we're too reliant on people's subjective perceptions of, of what Chinese intent might or might not be. China's not a monolith. Its intent is in participating in different parts of the international system is probably not monolithic either. Um, and so I think we need to have a, a much more data driven conversation about effects. Um, but to do that, we need to understand much better what the effects are, what they are on, on crime and public safety and human safety, human security on the one hand, and then what they are on democracy, civil liberties, and, and other rights um, on the flip side. Rob, do you want to weigh in on this as well? Only to say that the takeaway I have from, from what Julia and Sheena have said is transparency. Uh, one of the recommendations in my paper is that, you know, uh, it may be appropriate to have a kind of multilateral or, or even multi-stakeholder initiative to uh, uh, provide more transparency about the ways in which technical standard setting processes uh, might be manipulated uh, by various actors and just to better understand the implications of that uh, so we can uh, develop a coherent strategy on in, in how to respond. So that, that's kind of one of my big takeaways from their very uh, uh, helpful remarks. Great. So why don't we uh, start getting into the Q and A? Um, and the first question I want to pose, I think, I think actually Rob, we're going to come back to you first on this. But then of course, if Sheena and Julia have to want to add, that would be great as well. Um, and the question is one that. I think comes up a lot in the discussion about uh, Chinese tech companies. And uh, the answer I think is a hard one. So I'm very curious to see what you'll say to this. Um, and so in the words of the questioner, uh, what would be the consequences for Chinese tech companies that fail to conform to the Chinese party state, right? Which is, uh, you know, we also sometimes hear that question in terms of notwithstanding whatever we see in Chinese laws or in corporate announcements, if the party state wants a Chinese tech company to do a particularly nefarious thing, is there anything they can do to uh, avoid that obligation? Yeah, well, as you say, this is uh, you know one of the most difficult questions to answer because it's just so opaque and, and we just don't have good 
uh, information in terms of what happens behind the scenes. Uh, I was in a, a dialogue with Chinese counterparts recently um, where the question was posed, uh, you know, we were trying to think about what, what confidence building measures in this uh, area might look like. And, and the question was posed, uh, you know, when uh, when folks in China looked at the Apple FBI standoff, um, you know, where Apple refused to, uh, you know, break the encryption for an iPhone in a terrorism related, you know, clearly a national security investigation. Um, you know, how was that perceived in China? Did, did, did that engender any kind of uh, trust, uh, per se, you know, in, uh, with respect to Apple and its uh, practices and, and ability to uh, to not comply with particular requests. And uh, it was an interesting you know, set of responses. It wasn't a single, uh, a single response. And, and, um, but I think part of the problem is we don't have good uh, data or examples to draw upon uh, from China where companies have refused to comply. Uh, and you know, we can draw our own conclusions from that. Uh, there are little anecdotes out there that you know about various ways in which there's there's more play in the joints than than sometimes is appreciated in the public discourse. In other words, uh, it's not just that you know the party state has real time access to all the data uh, of every company, uh, but rather there there are uh, occasions when there's resistance to particular requests. You know this is anecdotal, uh, often you know anonymous uh, accounts. And so I think in, in helping to, um, uh, you know, get over, a lot of my paper is about the sources of distrust. And I think this is just a huge one. And if there's any way to overcome that, uh, I think there's just gotta be more um, transparency and, and information provided uh, from actors within China about the realities on the ground. Otherwise you're going to be feeding the kind of policy mindset that uh, that, that I laid out uh, in my earlier remarks, which I, you know, I think to a large extent, uh, you know, has a legitimate basis. Um, and you're going to have policy based on kind of worst case scenario assumptions. Um, so I, you know, I am not particularly optimistic. We're going to see <laughs> progress on that anytime soon. But, uh, you know, that's, that's my, my reaction to the, the question. Sheena, do you want to, and Julia too, if you want to jump in on this? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think there are a couple of um, of things to consider here. First of all, as, as Rob said, we don't have a good um, sense of, of how many cases of pushback there have been um, or whether any of them have been successful. Um, and so I, I think there are a couple of things going on there. First of all, a lot of the legislation that directs companies and individuals to cooperate is relatively new, and right? it was passed in sort of 2016 to on, you know going on this year. Um, and so this is part of a suite of national security legislation that Xi Jinping has been working on really since um, you know he promulgated this comprehensive national security doctrine or comprehensive national security framework in 2013-2014. Right? That kicked off a, a, a process of really overhauling the legal architecture. And I think it takes time to understand how those changes interact with each other, how they accumulate, and how they shape the environment that Chinese actors operate in. Um, so part of the reason why we don't have data is just that this is a very new environment. Um, and I think many of us who watch China closely have a sense that some of the old assumptions we might have applied no longer hold. Um, you know, and then we've seen things that the party state has done to reinforce the sense that it's very difficult for a company to say no and that there would be significant punishment for individuals or companies who try to resist or foot drag or didn't comply. Um, in the middle of the, you know, WeChat TikTok standoff, um, there was a new guideline issued that talked about the need to make tech companies more responsive to party leadership. Um, which was sort of a really astonishing coincidence of timing, if in fact it was a coincidence. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the Chinese political system itself is saying things um, to suggest that it is very hard for companies to, um, to openly defy um, a request from the authorities. They've made it clear that they, that they want to set up an ecosystem in which that compliance is more and more sort of organic. Um, 
And so, you know, I think we have to remember that there's a huge amount of in the surveillance field, right? So I'll limit my my remarks to surveillance since that's that's where I, I know the most, right? There's an incredible amount of government um, money that's being directed and incentivizing companies to develop the capabilities that the government wants and to compete for government procurement contracts. And so the other thing that we see is that the government has choices, right? It can get this information from any number of suppliers. Um, in at least some cases. So either they have signed a contract with the, the one that they think will be most compliant that has the best history, um, or if there's an emergency situation and they're trying to get information that they don't somehow naturally have access to. And I agree with Rob, right? It's not like there's some magic uh, automated inflow. There is in certain cases, um, and there are certain systems that are working toward that capability, but that's aspirational, it's not reality. Um, but we, you know, we also, I think, see that the Chinese um, government, in, and in particular, in this case with surveillance, it is the government, has fostered a marketplace in which companies are competing to get these contracts and suggesting that compliance is, is going to be, um, if not automated, then quite responsive to the party state's directives is going to be part of what helps um, companies succeed in, in winning those procurement contracts. Um, and so to me, that sort of larger environment of the way that companies are created, incentivized, directed to grow by the availability of, of procurement contracting is, is a really significant factor to consider um, in addition to then this you know, legal and policy framework that we've seen promulgated in the last few years. So Sheena, you uh, mentioned a couple of things uh, now that I think also lead into the next question that I wanna pose from our audience. Um, you, you talked about the general market, and of course, largely you're talking about the Chinese domestic market, but there's also the international market and the pressures that Chinese companies have vis-a-vis -vis that, that, that's significant. You also mentioned a gentleman by the name of Xi Jinping, uh, who's uh, uh, recently had the conclusion of his fifth plenum. Um, and the basic question has to do with this notion that the fifth plenum actually uh, also emphasized that China could somehow uh, respond to the pressure from the US on uh, various aspects of the technological front by boosting its domestic capacity. And you know, one of the particular areas that often gets discussed in this, in this, uh, in this setting is uh, semiconductors where uh, you know, we in the US have a very advanced semiconductor industry that the Chinese uh, market is very reliant upon, and, and our friend, Mr. Xi Jinping, uh, wants to change that. He wants to somehow boost China's domestic capacity. So in the, in the words of the questioner, um, asks, uh, China has talked a lot about, quote, stranglehold technologies, such as semiconductors, and attempted to boost domestic production capabilities. And so the question for all of you is, how should the US or private firms think about the role of these vital technologies as part of the strategy going forward. Who wants to jump in on, who wants to jump in on that? I mean, I don't know that I have a, a firm answer, but if I could offer just kind of a starting, a starting thought, um, it, you know, it's, it, um, I'd, I'd be particularly interested, I think, in, in Rob's take on this question. Um, but I, you know, I think as we, you know, as we think about uh, Xi Jinping's push um, to make China more domestically robust and uh, to build up a sort of more independent domestic base for a lot of these technologies, um, that's been pretty clear in Chinese intent, right? Again, this, this issue of aspiration versus reality um, for some time. Right and um, and you know I don't have a great sense across all the the multiple domains we're talking about of how successful some of China's own benchmarks are going to be whether it's you know 2025 2035 um, or beyond but um, but I, I think the the issue here is is to realize that um, you know that's a natural effect of uh, a push to decouple. Right, is that is that it's not that China is simply going to put its hands up and say, "Oh, never mind, we just won't develop those technologies." Um, that of course the sort of strategic response would be to augment domestic um, innovation and and domestic development. Um, 
And, you know, that's not to say that we have exactly the right mix of, of coupling or decoupling, right? The, the U.S.-China relationship on the tech front has always been selectively coupled. I think it always will be selectively coupled. We're in the midst of rethinking what the right selectivity is. Um, you know, and to me, that's a... a that's one of the things we need to think about, right? So maybe we need to make some real changes to the existing, you know, form and extent of coupling in the U.S.-China tech relationship. I'm I'm completely willing to to sort of have that, um, accept that that general principle is is sound, and that we need to be actively rethinking it as both countries change and as as technology itself progresses. Um, but on the other hand, you know, decoupling is going to have costs, even a very selective change to decoupling, right, is going to have costs. And one of those costs is going to be to spur domestic development and domestic innovation in exactly those areas in China, um, which makes the U.S. Um, less likely to be able to influence them as that capacity actually gets to, to a point where it's robust. Um, so I just think we need to we need to acknowledge that all policies have costs, right, and, and trade-offs. And so rethinking, um, you know, the nature of our selective coupling in the tech field with China means anticipating that cost and, and figuring out how to plan for it um, and whether it's the right cost for us to accept. Um, that's a really general statement of principle. Um, but the question was kind of how should we think about this? Um, so without necessarily getting into the details of, of semiconductors, um, as we think about this sort of big bilateral process or big bilateral framework, I think that's a really important sort of re um, reaction, counter reaction process to keep in mind and to keep in mind that, that we don't necessarily um, you know, have full control over that, right? China gets a say in how it responds to changes the United States makes and anticipating um, and accounting for, for the negative aspects of, of a response to a change in our policies is the job of American policymakers. And, you know, another cost, Sheena, is specific to semiconductors. It seems as if the semiconductor industry is very concerned um, that if their market in China is curtailed because of the combination of U.S. and now Chinese policies, they're going to lose out on the money that they rely on for innovation, which kind of goes back to the innovation point. But let me see if Rob or Julia wants to jump in on this question before we move on to another. Sure. I mean, I, I agree with an awful lot of, of what Sheen has laid out. And, you know, there was an article in Financial Times just yesterday uh, indicating that Notwithstanding uh, the Commerce Department's uh, tightening of uh, controls, uh, export controls, that is, on semiconductors specifically uh, destined for Huawei and its affiliates, uh, it appears, uh, according to this report, uh, that many licenses uh, are being approved if uh, the export is for uh, the Huawei's handset business as opposed to its 5G uh, uh, equipment business. And that's the kind of thing that seems to me, it, it gets to what Sheen is saying about how do you want to be selective and not, uh, as I believe the author of a, a recent paper uh, on exactly this question uh, put it, not cutting off our nose to spite our face, right? So thinking through the consequences for innovation, for companies' profits, uh, and the ways that they can plow that back into R&D, um, you know, thinking through what types of uh, of controls make the most sense, whether that means you know, having a different approach to the most advanced chips versus commodity chips, uh, and, and, and maybe a, a different approach altogether regarding uh, manuf semiconductor manufacturing equipment, uh, photolithography uh, equipment, uh, that sort of thing. And, and then coordinating that, right, with, with allies and partners, with other countries that have uh, you know, uh, similar capabilities in a way that's going to, uh, you know, again, just kind of bring some coherence to what Sheena described as this kind of being more selective about how we're decoupling. It's not to suggest that uh, one approach or the other is necessarily going to influence, uh, uh, you know, in a material way, China's trajectory in terms of trying to develop technological self-sufficiency. Uh, but again, it's just a matter of trying to bring a kind of uh, common sense uh, approach and, and a, a bit of balance to, to how we go about this. 
Yeah, so just very quickly on it, um, like I agree with the points that um, Sheena and Rob have raised and uh, like a data point for like cutting off your nose to spite your face is um, is uh, Wilbur Ross walking back uh, something in the entity list over summer regarding 5G. Um, so the entity list basically prevented US companies from participating in standards bodies um, with Chinese companies and um, uh, Wilbur Ross basically walked this back and said they can actually participate with Chinese companies and standards bodies because this was critical for like, you know, the US to stay ahead in terms of innovation. So, um, you know, there is that point there to back up, I think, the point that Rob made. Um, secondly, uh, in terms of uh, thinking about this being selective, I really like the way that Sheena put it. Um, I think earlier this month, uh, the White House published the National Strategy for Critical and Emerging Technologies. If you look at the back, there are like a list of 20 technologies. They are massive buckets. They are just, it's just everything. And so I think this really shows that we don't, we don't know yet exactly what are the critical technologies, but your policymakers and technologists need to work together to find out exactly down to the level of like the, the equivalent of semiconductors and all these different components in these technologies that they think are strategic, which are the ones that you really can't work, um, like you really don't want to be like um, built in another market. And, and finally, I think one of the things that's really missing um, from the national strategy is um, any kind of indication of resources that are being put aside in order to help um, companies uh, like move these uh, manufacturing businesses from one market to another in a place where the you know wages are going to be much higher and the impact this is going to have on like the innovation like timelines for U.S. companies and I think U.S. companies should really push on this and think of how they can protect their business if uh, there is a hard decoupling. So I'm sorry to say we've reached the end of our time, but we still have a lot of great questions. And so I'm going to um, beg the indulgence of the panelists and the audience to just go maybe a few more minutes over, just five more minutes over. Um, there's a couple of questions that there's no way we have time to answer. There's a few people who want to hear about the social credit system, and I feel like we would need another 90 minutes for that. So I apologize to the people who are interested in the social credit system. Um, we won't be able to get to those. But there's a, a couple of questions which I can group together and then give each of you no more than about a minute to, to wrap up. Um, and so the one grouping of questions I'm going to pose only to Sheena and Rob. Um, and those have to do with uh, whether a potential change in administration this time next week would potentially signal um, a difference in the U.S. approach on these issues? How significant is a potential change of presidential administration to that? Um, and so that's just for Sheena and Rob. And then the second question, which is just for Julia, who as her accent may betray is coming to us from uh, the UK. Uh, a few people want to hear you say things about the EU's, the European Union's stance on these issues um, one person wants to know whether the OECD could have a role and in general, whether the EU has a particular stance on these security risks. So just a minute each, we can start with Sheena, Rob, and then Julia. Okay, well, the, the short answer is yes and no. Uh, to take my full minute, what I would say is that, uh, you know, I think we would see a change in sort of approach and strategy. So I think we would see more active multilateral engagement um, I think we might see efforts to rejoin the UN Human Rights Council and engage with surveillance and human rights violation in, in that fora um, or those fora. Um, but I, I think that the underlying concern about uh, technology and the way that it poses a, a range of security threats in, in the US-China relationship um, is something that there's now bipartisan concern on. And so I think we should expect a certain amount of stability and continuity, um, even if the sort of the form and the, the approach to solving those problems is somewhat different. I think the priority will remain. Agree with Sheena. Uh, I think that probably the most significant difference uh, would be uh, an emphasis on working with allies and partners uh, and with and through uh, international law and institutions as well. Uh, and probably uh, more clear signaling from the very top about what exactly is going on uh, in terms of the concern, you know separating uh, the security concerns from, you know, broader trade uh, disputes 
and not giving the impression that you know this is all just a matter of uh, you know trying to um, hit back at China in various ways. Um, so I think a bit more coherence in terms of a policy making process, uh, a bit more uh, willingness to work uh, multilaterally, uh, and a bit more clarity in terms of messaging are uh, things that I would expect. Cool. Um, okay, so I think like at the highest level, right, the EU is, has the same kind of values as the US, you know, democracy, human rights, um, but it's not uh, completely the same political calculation with regards to Chinese tech giants, because they have very different legacy systems, and it's like 27 different member states. So you're going to be, and one other thing about the EU with regards to China is that they are engaging with China on a whole spectrum of issues, not just technology, which is quite different to the way the administration has been dealing with China um, for the past four years. So they're able to to, I think, negotiate and balance um, a range of issues that the US hasn't really been doing very well for the past four years on. Um, and I think another point on, on the EU front is that they've been really clear, I think, in recent announcements um, oh, and speeches that um, they don't really want to be the playing field for the US-China um, conflict. And actually, with their introduction of their digital sovereignty policy, um, they're indicating that they're basically carving out their own space. And indeed, they did this with the GDPR. Um, and finally, uh, what is the OECD's role in standard setting? I think at the moment they have uh, quite a good role in establishing standards for AI governance. Um, however, like in line with my earlier comments, I think it's just a very small group of people at the table there and there needs to be a much broader discussion with other stakeholders. Um, and um, I'm not sure that it's, uh, I, think, I think it's best that we basically look at how much impact these organizations have and kind of streamline it. Um, so at the moment, kind of influential, but I'm not sure if it's the best place for the long term. Well, great. So uh, thank you to all three panelists for this great discussion and to our audience for tuning in and submitting so many great questions. Uh, today's webinar does close out the fall webinar series for our project on the future of US-China relations. And so on behalf of my co-organizers, Jacques Delisle and Avery Goldstein, colleagues Yun Yuan Zhang and Amanda Morrison, and all the project participants who have lent their time and energies over the past few months. Let me just thank you all for watching and reading, and please stay tuned for more content from our project in the months and year ahead.